It's only been a few weeks, but my little wildlife pond has really started to transform. The bare ground has filled in with a mix of different plants and grasses, and it won't be long now before this area turns into a thick, lush jungle of flowers and seeds. Right now, everything is calm and relaxing, but it wasn't this way two weeks ago when all the wildlife at the pond had to take cover during an epic hailstorm. Luckily, this didn't cause too much damage, the pond was fine, but I hope the birds and wildlife were equally as lucky. In the pines behind the pond, I wondered if there was an actual screech owl in there, hunkered down, protected in its nest during the storm. In the first episode, I mentioned how I had been hearing a screech owl calling from these pines, so I had to take a closer look. I was hoping to find any behavior that indicated that an owl was actually nesting here. The first video was a white-breasted nuthatch, moving along the tree line. Not quite the owl we were looking for. In the next one, I thought maybe this silhouette was an owl, but it turned out to be a crow. This flicker seems very interested at something in this cavity, but still no owl. All it takes is one visit from some blue jays to confirm there is an owl in this cavity. A few videos later, as a red squirrel climbed the tree, the screech owl revealed itself. I thought this pretty much confirmed that they were nesting here, but after a month of running a trail camera, this was the only time it actually showed up. It turned out that this cavity wasn't used as a nest at all, but rather as a roosting site. Even though there aren't any owls nesting in the pines, there is some nesting activity nearby. Right beside the pines, a pair of tree swallows have chosen one of my boxes as their new nesting site. At this time of the year, all the tree swallows are at different stages. Some of them are sitting on eggs and defending their nest box, some are mating, and some are just starting to build their nests. This male tree swallow is on the lookout for a very important material for his nest, feathers. The problem with these feathers is not only finding them, but figuring out how to bring them into the nest box. This male just can't seem to find the right angle to bring it into the nest box. The female, who has been watching him struggle for a while, gets a little annoyed and starts pressuring him to bring the feather inside. She doesn't want to let a great material like this go to waste. Still no luck, but this pair has a couple of weeks to figure it out. Over the next week, the female works hard to collect grasses to add to the nest, and as she adds them, she'll start shaping the cup for her eggs. A lot of the dead grasses she's collecting actually came from around the pond after I tilled the grass to make the wildflower meadow. The female digs her body into the nest in order to form a small cup big enough to fit between four and seven eggs. This pair was making great progress, but just as the cup was starting to take its shape, this happened. Red squirrels are opportunistic feeders, and at this time of the year, they'll raid nests looking for eggs or nestlings. This one didn't get a meal, but the damage it caused has kept the tree swallows from coming back for over a week now. But that's nature, life goes on, and while I was adding some pipe to protect the nest boxes from future ground predators, I noticed two chickadees coming out of a nearby tree cavity. They always appreciate a visit, with a snack of course, and I watched them for a while as they excavated their new cavity. It's a tight squeeze, but this means that predators will have a much harder time getting to the nest.
Nearby, another chickadee pair prefers a nest cavity with, I guess you can call it a fancier built-in security system. For one of the smallest birds in the area, a protected nesting site like this almost guarantees a successful nesting season. Speaking of smaller birds, why not talk about the smallest one at the pond, the ruby-throated hummingbird. This male hummingbird has established his territory directly around the pond. He has his favorite perches that he moves between to survey the area in case any other males dare enter his territory. For a hummingbird that weighs a little more than a penny, there are rules to follow to be as intimidating as possible. First, never give up the high ground. This spot just isn't high enough. Perfect. Next, you have to puff up from the size of one strawberry to the size of two. Don't forget to show off your sharp beak. And of course, be ready at any moment to display your brilliant red gorget and jump into action. Luckily for this male, it's been a quiet spring and he hasn't had to defend his territory too hard. With all of this action around the pond, I thought it was a good time for my first day of photography in the blind. Well, the time has finally come. I'm gonna use the blind for the first time to film and photograph wildlife at the pond. I realized I didn't give much of a, an overview of the blind when I was building it in the first episode and that's just because I wanted to wait for this episode when I was actually using it. So I'll give you a quick tour around and show you what I did and why I did it. There's two sections to this blind. The ground level over here, I dug this low just to get eye level with the birds when they're at the water. So you can see a nice clean view all the way to the bank over there. And another benefit to this is that since I'm lower, I'm getting a nice breeze roll in and the ground over here is colder. So compared to last year, if you uh, there's still grass growing in here. That's crazy. I guess enough light gets through. Uh, but if you remember last year's video, I was sweating like crazy in that little tent blind that I had. So uh, no more of that. I think I should be pretty comfortable in here. And another thing I did in the front over here, you might be able to notice this wood chip mulch. If I move this right under here, this is cardboard. And the goal with this is to choke out the grasses. So I put that all throughout the front area and even on the sides over here so that throughout the season when grasses are growing like crazy there should be nothing growing here so I get a clean shot to the pond and that's just one less headache when you're shooting you don't have like a bunch of grass in your way the next part of the blind is the standing area and I made this section for a few reasons the first one being last year when I was at the pond a lot of the birds would go and bathe and then they would just land on the branches so getting eye level with those birds when they're on the branches is way easier if you can stand instead of having to try to angle your lens up. Another reason I made this section was because I wanted to build a little garden here. So the plants that I put in here were the ones that were at the old pond. So this is kind of just like an ode to the old pond. And I also put some of the wildflower seeds in here. So I'm hoping some of those will come up. Another reason I made this is that I put the hummingbird feeder right over here. So when they come visit, I can probably use my macro lens and photograph them directly from the blind. I am going to put shelves in over here and kind of pretty much everywhere, actually. I want shelves no matter where I go. That's pretty much it for now. I know there's a lot of things I have to do. I still don't have a roof here. And I don't know, there's a bunch of things I need to do. But every time I sit down in here, I just think of other things that I can do to benefit the wildlife. And I just kind of move outside and start working around the area. And I'm not really putting much time and thought into this at the moment. But that'll come. When the wildlife's comfortable and everything's working smoothly, that's when I'll start souping this up and getting a little bit uh, a little bit fancy with it. Another addition I made to the pond that I forgot to mention was this floating mechanism to hold the willow cuttings from my last pond. Originally, I had them in containers, which didn't look great, but I also didn't want to get rid of them altogether. So I thought about hydroponics, and I built this floating structure so that the roots can free float in the water. This holds about 50 cuttings and it moves freely around the pond when I'm not using it. The roots float and help absorb nutrients without digging into the banks of the pond. And when I'm sitting in the blind and doing photography, I can just put it in the corner out of my shooting lane. This obviously isn't the nicest design, it's more of a proof of concept, but it works well and it's only temporary until the pond starts filling up with plants.
All right, so everything is set up and good to go. All we have to do now is wait for that first species to show up. There's a lot of things calling right now. So if you wanted to make an educated guess, I hear song sparrow, chipping sparrow, goldfinch at the back, tree swallows flying up ahead, starlings. Yeah, that wouldn't be that great of a bird, but yeah, starlings nonetheless. Uh, house wren calling and a great crested flycatcher in the back. So there's stuff around, stuff's calling. We're getting some clouds now. If you wanted to make a really out of this world guess, you can probably go with a great auk. 10 million to one odds, great odds. I'm gonna go middle of the pack in terms of difficulty. I'm, I'm hoping first bird would be an Eastern bluebird. That would just be an awesome species to kick off the pond, but we'll see. Well, if you guessed the chipping sparrow would be the first bird, you are correct. Sorry for those of you who guessed great auk. This tiny sparrow kicked off the season and shortly after, two American goldfinch and a song sparrow joined in. Now, this is the part of the video where I would love to just keep naming birds that showed up, but these were really the only three species that visited the water in over two hours. A likely explanation is we've had cool, wet weather throughout the week and birds just have plenty of options for water. The pond is really at its best during the hot, dry summer months. Even though it was quiet, I stuck it out and I was rewarded quickly with a few visits from morning doves, European starlings, and an American robin. In the distance, I could hear a brown thrasher calling. There were three brown thrashers at the pond earlier in the season, but after a few days, two of the brown thrashers paired up and disappeared, leaving this one by itself. Since then, it's been singing continuously, trying to attract a mate, but so far, no luck. Tonight, it landed right next to the trees at the pond, and it was the clearest I've ever heard their beautiful mimicking song. After the thrasher left, I waited around until the sun set, and just as I was getting ready to call it a night, I heard a very peculiar sound. That's a woodcock. That's, that's a dog. But that was a woodcock calling. I don't know where he's calling from. Nah, I can't see anything. I'm gonna grab my binoculars. I'll place you guys right here. I need to go find out where this woodcock's calling from because I've never seen one at the pond, and that would be pretty sweet. Give me one sec. So I found the woodcock, Ooh. I found the woodcock. There's a path that I use to drive back to the pond over here. He's right in the middle of it and he's calling out and every so often he's gonna take flight, do his little flight display and then he dropped back down right into the middle of that path. So I'm pretty pumped because I've never photographed them, never filmed them, never really had much of a chance to work with them. It's a green frog calling behind me. So I'm gonna have to come out tomorrow. It's way too dark now to get any footage, but I'm gonna come back out tomorrow evening and see if he's still around. Hopefully he's still here because I would love to get him and kind of add him to the pond list. Well, as it turns out, this woodcock made himself very comfortable here. So much so that he became a part of my morning ritual when leaving for work. Psst. Come on, buddy. You gotta move. I wanna hit you. There you go. Come on, buddy. You gotta move, buddy. There you go. So this is the third morning that the woodcock is here. It's like Groundhog Day. Every morning I need to start the same way, just shooing it off the road. I've been wanting to go out the past couple of nights to try to get it, but it's been really rainy and really cloudy, so I haven't heard it at all. Uh, but it's here still every morning when I when I leave for work. So I think tonight's the night. It's looking really clear that we're gonna try to get this woodcock. Later that day, I mosquito-proofed myself and got down into position well before dusk. Even though I saw it that first evening, I still wasn't 100% sure when it shows up. 
So I could get here at dusk, get here before, after, I'm not really sure. I do know that woodcocks like to stay in thicker forest during the day where they can forage for worms. I have been lucky enough this season to see it once while surveying during the day. Obviously it's when I don't have my camera, but it was amazing to see its neat behavior where they do that rocking motion back and forth as they walk. Apparently it's to cause vibrations and move worms around beneath the ground and they can hear those worms moving around and it's easier for them to find them. So during the day they're kind of harder to see, but they are around. And then a little later around dusk they come out into the open areas to do their incredible display. So what my plan is I'm staying literally right where I see it every morning and I'm hoping it's a creature of habit even at dusk or actually I'm hoping it comes before dusk because there'd be enough light for me to be able to film it and photograph it. But at the same time it's a species I've never worked with before so whatever I get you know that's what I get that's the best that I have so far so whether it's grainy and dark I'm still gonna try to get as much as I can. I swore I just heard it call twice. Not that usual paint call. Oh, song sparrow. Not the paint call. Not the... I can't get through a sentence. Not the paint call, not the flight display, that other alternate call that they do. The, um, I can't imitate bird calls, but the... That, that's... <laughs> that was so crap. Don't listen to that. That's not what it sounded like. But they do this other little call that I could have swore I just heard twice, but there's also brown thrashers, great catbirds and starlings in the area that are calling, which are all mimics. So it's very possible that's what I heard. But I have to make sure that I'm looking both in front of me and behind me because I've seen them up ahead and I've seen them also down the road a little bit. I could have swore, you know when you just get that feeling that you're like, I feel like that was it. I feel like that was it. Sun has officially set and it's just me and the mosquitoes now. Everything's really quieted down. I can hear some spring peepers calling in the distance. But this is a time when I need to really use my eyes and ears and try to spot it because now that the sun's down, it can pop up at any moment. About 15 minutes after the sun had set, I was staring in front of me at the empty path and watching my ISO creep higher and higher losing just a little bit of faith that it won't show up, when suddenly... Oh my god, there it is. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's so hard to see. These are my first shots of woodcock right here. I can zoom in like this. There you go, you can see it much better. He's gonna paint again. Yes, how freaking cool is that? Even though there was only enough time to get a few videos, I'm still so thankful I was able to spend some time this close to an American woodcock. With warmer days ahead, there's no telling what'll show up to my little wildlife pond next, but I'm so excited to find out. <laughs>